So our first talk will be uh, glucomatis versus non-glucomatis optic neuropathy. No, no, actually, it was but you were. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for staying for the glaucoma, uh, for the glaucoma, for the neuro-ophthalmology session. We're going to be talking about glaucomatous versus non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy today. I'd like to take a moment to thank the speakers and the organizers and uh, all the participants for attending today. Um, it's a true pleasure and honor to be here. I have no financial disclosures. So when do we suspect glaucoma? We suspect glaucoma when we see cupping of the optic nerve head. This is the hallmark of glaucoma. If you even see vertical elongation, I don't know if this is, this is not working for me, uh, vertical elongation of the cup to disc ratio, when there's a focal notch, when the cupping extends to the rim, when there's a splint or heme, when the, there is preservation of the neuroretinal rim with no pallor, nasalization of the vessels, these are all features of glaucoma that make you suspect that we're dealing with a glaucomatous optic neuropathy. But sometimes it's not as clear. And sometimes glaucoma is associated with other things, or at least concomitant with other things uh, that are not related to the glaucoma. So how do we differentiate? Another situation would be that if we see a visual field that looks glaucomatous, not the, the uh, yeah. Oh, they have to do it. OK. Um, so the visual field deficits uh, may look glaucomatous, but uh, then uh, the reason would be not be underlying glaucoma. So next slide, please. Um, next slide. Okay, so we suspect glaucoma um, when we take history and examination and investigations that have to be thorough, okay? Uh, is there a way that I can control it? Because this is a bit distracting to me. Oh, it's working. Okay, it wasn't working. For, no, it's not. Is, is it? Are you... Uh, can you give me some control? Sorry about that. We're going to go back. Is this my control? Okay, great. This is great. Now I have control. Great. Okay. So when do we suspect glaucoma? So on a history, the patient is usually about 50 years of age, so an elderly patient comes to you, and in the mid to, to uh, early stages of glaucoma, they're usually asymptomatic. On examination, we talked about uh, the cupping features and all the glaucomatous features that you find on an optic nerve head. Usually the visual acuity is that of 20-20, a full color and no RAPD. 
And when you look at the investigations, you, do, you should do visual fields and OCTs. The visual fields start with an infranasal visual field loss and extend to, the, to an arcuate. They can be a, respecting the horizontal uh, midline. Uh, and in later stages, they can go, of course, to the center. The OCT of the RNFL usually shows superior and inferior uh, fiber loss. And the GCIPL uh, shows, uh, can show segmental loss. An OCT macula is usually normal. So when do we suspect that it's not glaucoma? Well, we also take a history and exam and investigate. So if the history is such that this is a younger patient, younger than 50 years of age, when the patient is symptomatic, especially when there is rapid visual loss, when you examine the patient and you see that the vision is not 20-20, there is a central visual acuity loss, there is color vision loss, there may be an RAPD if it's a completely unilateral process or a, a severely asymmetrical process. When you examine the patient and you see that pallor is more than the cupping, then you of course think about a non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And from an investigation standpoint, when the visual field does not look glaucomatous, so if there's a central loss or a sequocentral loss, if there's temporal loss initially, or a loss that respects the vertical midline. On the OCT or NFL, when the loss is not that of superior or inferior, but rather a papillomacular bundle loss or a nasal fiber loss, you consider something that is not glaucoma. And when you look at the GCIPL and you see something that is a clue, such as a homonymous defect on the GCIPL or by nasal loss, then you consider something that is non-glaucomatous. Also look at your OCT macula. Sometimes you see a visual field defect that looks glaucomatous, but when you look at the OCT macula, you'll see that there's thinning of the inner retina that may have indicated that this is a branch retinal artery occlusion that you may have not seen or diagnosed otherwise. End-stage glaucoma is much more difficult to differentiate from non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy, um, and sometimes that is challenging even to the most expert. So what are we trying to distinguish glaucoma from? So the glaucoma mimickers could be something acquired or congenital. Acquired could be optic nerve or retina. The optic nerves could be something that is compressive in nature. It could be other things that are inflammatory, hereditary, ischemic, toxic, and traumatic. If it's compressive in nature, this is the one that we want to rule out to rule out an active compressive, of course, tumor, for example. And this is when there's you know, visual loss, central loss, pallor, and all these things. The other uh, listed here, the inflammatory hereditary ischemic, if you take a good history, you often will not miss those things. Retinal disease usually mimics glaucoma by way of visual field deficits. Vascular occlusions or previous vascular occlusions, retinitis pigmentosa, PRP, high myopia, and the congenital anomalies of the disc also can mimic a glaucomatous visual field. So look at the discs very carefully for tilted discs, glaucomas and pits, hypoplasias, morning glories, megalopapilla, and often these are non-progressive in nature. Now optic disc drusing can, be cause, can cause a progressive optic neuropathy, and if you see any progression, of course, you need to image those patients. If you see pallor, you need to image those patients, even though they have these congenital disc anomalies. Some examples of congenital disc anomalies here um, borrowed from uh, seminars of ophthalmology, glaucoma mimickers paper. This here um, on the left top side is an inferior optic nerve coloboma, giving you that visual field deficit that looks glaucomatous. This here is an enlarged blind spot from a morning glory, which is, you know, blind spot is not really uh, typical of glaucoma. This here is a superior segmental hypoplasia uh, that's giving you those inferior uh, visual field deficits. So then how do you approach the pseudoglaucoma suspect? we go back to our main history exam and investigations. So now that you have this list, always be thorough on your history. When you examine, of course, uh, you're gonna do an optic nerve and a retina exam, but I write it here because you have to do an intentional optic nerve head and, uh, exam looking for the congenital disc anomalies and looking for atypical features that may indicate that this is not glaucoma, such as pallor, for instance. And of course, look at the retina too, because sometimes we're too focused on the nerve and we kind of just screen through the retina very quickly. So look at the vessels. They could be attenuated in the retinopathy and look at the rest of the retina, retinitis pigmentosa, PRPs, and so forth. When you investigate, of course, you're doing visual fields and OCTs and uh, add to your OCTs and OCT macula, as I mentioned, because sometimes remote vascular occlusions uh, can only be diagnosed that way. So this is pretty much what I need to tell you today, but now we're gonna take you through a series of live cases. So this is a 25, uh, this is a 52 year old gentleman uh, who comes in with a very, very gradual loss of vision of the right eye to 2050 over the past year. 2025 in the left, there is loss of color vision on the right and the right RAPD. So right off the bat, this seems a bit odd for glaucoma. 
But you know, if it's an end stage glaucoma, you know, it could be. The left asymptomatic eye looks like this. There's this inferior loss. And the right eye shows the superior and inferior losses peripherally, but there is a smack right in the middle of a sequocentral scotoma. This is very atypical of glaucoma. So the first thing we want to rule out here is a compressive etiology. Now looking at the optic nerves here is um, a little bit of asymmetry in the cupping, but the, uh, cup, uh, the nerves otherwise look well. There is not really much pallor there. There's no other indications of glaucoma. So there's a mismatch between the optic nerve appearance and the visual field deficit. Although asymmetry can, of the cupping can be you know, happening in glaucoma as well. So we imaged this patient and lo and behold, he had a huge meningioma compressing the optic nerves on the right and the left uh, with this vasogenic edema. It's very important to recognize compressive etiologies because if the patient has good thickness on the OCT, which this patient had, normal OCT, RNFL, and GCIPL, there's a good chance that we will recover the visual field deficit that has been lost. So this patient was admitted and he was resected and visual fields returned back to normal. So early recognition of compressive um, uh, optic neuropathy is very, very important. And it's important to tease out what is glaucoma and what is compressive uh, if you had both. Uh, cupping can be uh, a result of um, compressive etiologies, uh, compressive uh, optic neuropathies. And uh, the red flags to look for, and these are the specific red flags, um, in a young patient, central visual loss, pallor, the type of visual field defect, especially if there's a vertical respect. So always look at the visual fields both at the same time, because sometimes a bitemporal hemianopia is only seen by looking at both fields at the same time. Uh, of course, asymmetry, when you see that the optic nerve head doesn't match the amount of visual field deficit and the type of nerve fiber bundle loss. Uh, if the MRI is reported normal, uh, I often look at the internal carotid artery um, and see if it's compressing that uh, optic nerve as well. There are some uh, reported cases of compressive opt optic neuropathy from ICA compression. So just having a normal MRI with a patient who is progressing uh, despite a normal IOP, uh, IOP, you want to consider that as a possibility. We can talk about that later, uh, but um, that's something to consider. Our next case is a 68-year-old female who has been having vision loss over the past month to counting finger vision um, and a left RAPD. Her IOP was 25 on the right, 28 on the left. When you look at this fundus photo, she looks quite glaucomatous on the left side with that inferior deep notch with a high cup to disc ratio, no pallor, and nothing else really going on, and the right optic nerve looks good. The left visual field is completely dark, and uh, so if this patient indeed has glaucoma, there must be something else that's going on, right? unless it's a rapidly aggressive glaucoma, which is quite unusual. So this patient was investigated as a retrobulbar optic neuritis. She was checked for blood work, uh, chest imaging, imaging of the brain, and she was also started on steroids, and she was quite refractory. She didn't improve, and uh, no diagnosis was found at that time. She comes in two months later, and this happens in the right eye now. And so she's losing her vision to counting fingers over the past two months this time. So looking at the optic nerve here, it looks swollen, not like the first eye, right? And so this patient was investigated again for a possible retrobulbar optic neuritis that is atypical. So blood work was done, whole body scan was done, imaging was done of the brain, and no uh, cause was found. Now, because this is a bilateral sequential optic neuropathy, despite the age of the patient, despite being a woman, uh, she was also checked for Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And as it turns out, she was positive for Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy. She also had glaucoma, so she had both at the same time. She was left with NLP vision OU, unfortunately, with severely cupped nerves and loss of the ganglion cell layer. This is just to say that about 50% of Lieber's can present with not the typical features, which is the pseudoedema and the telangiectasia, and so to, keeping that in mind is very, very important. In addition, um, Lieber's can also heal with cupping as well. On the other hand, this is a 32-year-old man who is, you know, minimally symptomatic, let's just put it that way. And he says that, you know, he never had 20-20 vision since at least grade two. His vision is 2060 with no color vision. He has no RAPD. And he was investigated with an MRI orbits and brain with contrast and no compressive etiology was found. His visual fields look nonspecific and his optic nerves look like this. So there's a large cup to disc ratio, and there is temporal excavation of these optic nerves with a lot of pallor. There is loss of the RNFL, loss of the GCIPL. This is a typical case of dominant optic atrophy. And this patient tested for a positive for the OPA1 gene. 
Now, usually they come with central or secocentral scotomas. So these nonspecific field deficits may indicate that this patient maybe has glaucoma on top of the DOA. So this patient has to be followed for progressive uh, visual defect because DOA should not progress. So hereditary optic neuropathies usually are bilateral, even if they're bilateral sequential in Liebers. They usually uh, cause central visual loss, color vision loss, sequocentral scotoma, and loss of the papillomacular bundle. And remember, if you face a patient who has a painless progressive optic neuropathy that is especially not responsive to steroid, even if the nerves look normal initially, then look for Liebers. Another case is a 66-year-old man with incidental finding of a visual field defect, as you can see here in the right eye, infranasal visual field defect, 20-20 vision, full color, with a small right RAPD. The OCTR NFL shows segmental loss corroborating with the visual field deficit, as well as the GCIPL OCT. So looking glaucomatous so far, but the right RAPD is telling us a little bit of something. Also, the optic nerves don't look glau glaucomatous whatsoever. In fact, they're elevated, but they're not swollen. There's a small cup to disc ratio. And if you look at the right optic nerve, there is temporal segmental pallor. They have scaloped edges, and this patient was a vasculopath. The patient had optic nerve hadrusin, and we presume that this patient had a NAION. Now, because this patient is incidental, and we need to image this patient, because if they gave us a history that is clearly like I woke up with inferior altitudinal visual field def defect uh, that is not progressive, then we would say, you know, confidently that with this was probably NAION. But because it's incidental, it's, must, it's important uh, to take a look and make sure it's not a compressive etiology. Also, it's important to follow up these patients because optic nerve hydrosine can cause progressive optic neuropathy, in which case then you would give them IOP lowering medication. This is another case of an asymptomatic 51-year-old female who has bionasal visual field deficits, glaucomatous-looking OCT, RNFL, some segmental loss on that GCIPL. Again, the nerves don't look glaucomatous, but sometimes the nerves just don't. They kind of look tilted, very difficult to, to tell is this glaucoma or not. This patient had elevated optic nerves but not swollen. The patient had um, uh, optic nerve hydrosin. So sometimes optic nerve hydrosin can look like glaucoma. But I wouldn't jump to treat this patient right away because this patient may have had this visual field deficit all their life. It may never progress. So I won't commit them to IOP lowering medication just yet. But I will follow them up. And if they progress, then I will put them on an IOP lowering drug. This is a 74-year-old female who has these, looking, uh, these cupped looking optic nerves. They are cupped, more so on the right than the left. There is pallor more uh, on the right than the left. The patient has some inferior altitudinal defects corroborating OCT, RNFL, and GCIPL. Now, if you just see this case without asking a history, you may think this patient has glaucoma, but the patient tells us that this, she had a sudden bilateral inferior altitudinal visual field loss that is stable ever since. And if you look in the old charts, the patient had swelling with each episode of the optic nerve. So this is ischemic optic neuropathy that just healed with cupping. So it's important to ask about GCA and check for serology for GCA. And despite having no symptoms and a normal serology, the fact that it was bilateral and that the patient healed with cupping made me th think that let's just do a temporal artery biopsy. And it was positive for giant cell arteritis. And what this is telling us is that AAION heals with cupping more, much more than NAION does. In fact, in a paper by Helen Danishmeyer, it talks about AAION healing with cupping in 92% of the cases versus 2% in NAION. Now, visual acuity and color vision can be spared typically in NAION and atypically in AAION. So it can happen in both. So ask about the history. Look at the old charts uh, because it's important because sometimes that gives you the whole story or at least part of the story. This is a 65-year-old lady, and if you look here, you can see that the nerves kind of looked cupped, maybe glaucomatous. There's temporal sloping. There's bearing of the circumlinear vessel. There's this inferior altitudinal visual field loss on the left eye, a little bit of a thinning on that uh, OCT RNFL. Now, this patient had a thinning of the inner macular, la uh, inner retinal layers, indicating a branch and a remote branch retinal artery occlusion. And sometimes these patients are completely asymptomatic. But it's very important to recognize because this is a stroke. So you have to send this patient to the stroke clinic for optimization of stroke risk factors. This patient was not asymptomatic. This patient was symptomatic. In fact, you can see in the left optic uh, nerve here that she had a hole in horse plaque. You've all picked this up. So she had an inferior altitudinal visual field defect that was sudden onset, 
She was a vasculopath. And if you look at the big picture early on, she had a superior branch retinal artery occlusion on that left side with that Hollenhorst plaque. And she had edema of the inner layers of the macula with paracentral acute middle maculopathy there that you can see. We're almost done. This is a 25-year-old lady who comes in, and you can see that there is a little bit of more cupping on the right than the left. She has superior archaeoid defects. This is uh, borrowed from uh, a paper of glaucoma mimickers. And if you look closely at the arterioles, you'll see that they are attenuated. And in fact, she had sectoral uh, retinitis pigmentosa, which is really the reason she had these superior archaeoid defects. So this is not glaucoma. It's a retinal cause for glaucoma. We talked about those. So the retinal causes um, of visual field deficits that can look like glaucoma would be something like remote vascular occlusions, RP, PRP. So look at the retina, look at your macular OCTs, and review the previous charts. So really the take home here is that glaucoma mimickers may be congenital or acquired. It may be an active process, like a compressive pathology. It may be a remote process, such as an old BRAO. You have to follow up your patients, even if you diagnose them with congenital disc anomalies. If there is pallor or if there's progression, do image those patients. And the imaging should be MRI orbits and brain with contrast. Glaucoma may be overlap overlapping with other entities, and sometimes you actually find something on the imaging, but it's not always the cause. So you may want to ask your neuroophthalmologist friend to help you distinguish whether the, the lesion that is found on the imaging is actually causing uh, a compressive optic neuropathy in order for the patient not to go for an unnecessary intervention, let's say if it's a benign incidental meningioma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dana. I would like to introduce Dr. Raed, who will be talking about update on optic neuritis. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. I have no financial interest. So, uh, this is supposed to be an update about optic neuritis, and you're going to hear me talk about what's typical and what is atypical optic neuritis, because there has been some evolution in our understanding of optic neuritis over the last 20 to 30 years. And we know now that optic neuritis now, it's not a single disease, it's a multitude of uh, different phenotypes. So what is a typical optic neuritis? It's a disease that presents with unilateral loss of vision, usually associated with pain with eye movement, and the visual acuity can be between 20, 20 to 20, 100. And it responds to steroids, and what you would see if you obtain an MRI with these patients is the typical MS kind of lesions, and you probably would diagnose this patient as either optic neuritis, as a clinically isolated syndrome, and you would probably consider referring this patient to a neurologist. Anything that deviates from this now, it's called atypical optic neuritis, and uh, this can be a multitude of different diseases, including NMO, infectious, and other autoimmune disorders. So those of you who have trained at my age or probably older uh, would know that what, all what we know about the treatment of optic neuritis now comes from the optic neuritis treatment trial. And this is a, the definitive trial that was done 30 years ago, and it gave us guidelines in terms of how to treat and how to investigate uh, optic neuritis patients. So this trial was done like 30 years ago, and it really is, it applies to only those patients who have typical optic neuritis, that is optic neuritis associated with MS. However, the, uh, the participants of that trial were predominantly young, white women, they were unilateral, and they, were, they excluded patients less than 18 years of age. Now, as far as the visual outcome of that study, what they found is that uh, no matter if you treat, if you don't treat, the vision will always get better. And after 15 years, those who uh, 
where 72% of optic neuritis patients had visual acuity of 2020, and 66% had uh, at least uh, 2020 in, in both eyes. So, um, what they also found is that oral steroids were associated with increased risk of recurrence, and they were, uh, um, the study uh, uh, basically recommended not using oral steroids for treatment, and then although IV steroids were not, um, were not, did not really improve the long-term visual outcome, they did give some kind of short-term benefit against the development of clinically def definite multiple sclerosis. What about the risk of MS from optic neuritis? The long-term follow-up showed that um, the benefit uh, that the uh, IV steroids uh, really only speeded the visual outcome, and the 15 years uh, results showed that 72% of those patients who had at least one lesion, one brain uh, MRI lesion, had 72% of risk of developing multiple sclerosis, and overall 50% of those patients on the study converted to MS. And this is just the, uh, the uh, results, 15-year results. So if you have the, the higher the, the burden of the lesion, the brain, the, the higher the risk of multiple sclerosis, and it can go up to up to 78% if you have three lesions or more. But what we do know right now is that this really does not apply to all optic neuritis, because uh, the study exclu excluded patients who had bilateral optic neuritis, and um, they probably focused on Caucasian women, so we know that patients from different ethnic backgrounds, let's say Asians or African, um, they tend to get different types of optic neuritis, so the, the study findings did not really apply to those. And we now have good serum biomarkers for diseases such as NMO and MOG, that um, these, uh, the, again, the, the LNTT study really does not apply to those type of optic neuritis. The other thing is with the optic neuritis treatment trial is that the uh, window was only up to eight days for treatment. <clears throat> so if you look at optic neuritis worldwide, we know that now there's, for example, there's a higher incidence of NMO in Asia and the East and also in African Americans. And there is a higher incidence of bilateral optic neuritis in Asia. Remember that the optic neuritis treatment trial excluded patients with bilateral optic neuritis. And the other thing is that uh, clinically, in some studies, that 50% of those patients that, with optic neuritis in Asian study really do not have pain with eye movement. So we know now, because we have new biomarkers for optic neuritis, that we have new phenotypes namely NMO and MOG, and these type of optic neuritis really follow a different pathophysiological mechanism than what we see, expect to see in demyelinating MS type optic neuritis. They tend to be more aggressive, and um, NMO is really a blinding disease. It's not like optic neuritis that if you, whether you treat or you don't treat, the vision will always get better. So early diagnosis is important, and this can be done by obtaining the specific biomarker, and the uh, long-term treatment for NMO is different than MS. You cannot treat, you, can use, you cannot use the same medications. So what they did is that they went back to the optic neuritis treatment trial and tried to find out there were any uh, uh, participant in the study that had any of these biomarkers. And so out of 177 patients, they only found about three who were MOG positive. And if you look at the characteristics of these uh, patients, they all had this Kadima at presentation. They had complete recovery of visual acuity, and none of them were uh, corticosteroid dependent. And none of these patients developed MS even after 15 years of follow-up. Two patients actually in that study had complete recovery of visual field, and one had residual visual field defect. So the way we treat optic neuritis, according to the optic neuritis treatment trial is by giving the patient IV steroids for three to five days. Although now there's, there are some studies that suggest oral steroids may be as, uh, as equally effective. So if you can give the patient uh, 1,250 of oral prednisone or even 500 oral methyl prednisolone, this can be as effective as giving them IV steroids. And oral steroids are cheaper, they don't require admission to the hospital, and they're more convenient to use. 
So when should you suspect atypical optic neuritis or NMO or MOG? If you have severe lo loss of vision, almost 90% of patients of the optic neuritis treatment trial had vision between 2020 to 2200. So if you have NLP vision, if you have bilateral disease, if the patient does not improve after six weeks, not that, that you would wait that long before you start treatment, and if they have progressive course, the lack of pain, and if you see atypical findings in the fundus, such as severe disc edema or hemorrhages. The other thing is that recurrence, if you, let's say you give the patient steroids and then they relapse immediately once you stop the steroid. This is all signs of an atypical type of optic neuritis. And we now have criteria to diagnose neuromyelitis optica, spectrum disorder, so basically you need at least one core characteristic, which is any one of those, one of which is optic neuritis, and you need to have a positive test for the aquaporin for immunoglobulin using cell-based cell -based, uh, assay. So NMO optic neuritis is usually unilateral, can be bilateral, however, and it tends to cause more severe and rapid loss of vision. Females are more affected. You don't tend to see disc edema in these patients. And um, uh, just to add to the difficulty that we're facing right now, you might have sometimes clinical overlap between what is typical and what is atypical optic neuritis. So sometimes they don't really present with severe loss of vision, as you would expect from NMO, and this is kind of the overlap between NMO and MS optic neuritis. So we now have a cell-based assay. We have a specific biomarker to look at NMO, and uh, it's very specific, 80% sensitive, and sometimes you can get a false negative result. You have to repeat the test maybe three, up to three to six months. Plus, you could do the lumbar puncture and get, look at the uh, cells, and you can look at the oligoclonical band, which, uh, which are uncommon in uh, NMO as opposed to MS. So as far as the neuroimaging findings, MRI of the orbit is really important because back in the days, people were not getting uh, orbital uh, MRI because it doesn't really add to the diagnostic value. We you know that it's important to obtain MRI of the orbit, and you want to look at the length of the optic nerve involved. So if you have a long segment, such as in this patient, you have, remember, there's more than 50% of segment involved of the optic nerve with enhancement. If you have posterior visual pathway enhancement, if you have chiasmal enhancement or involvement of the posterior visual, posterior part of the optic nerve, this is more suggestive of a neuromyelitis optica. Uh, this is another uh, patient. You can see here in the left, upper left side, there's chiasmal involvement, which is really atypical for MS. You only see that with, uh, with uh, neuromyelitis optica. As far as the brain lesions for NMO, remember these lesions tend to hang around where there's high aquaporin-4, so they tend to be concentrated in the diencephalon region, the, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and around the fourth ventricle. So should you obtain NMO, IgG, in every optic neuritis? Some studies have tried to address that question, and they found that the older age of the patient and the lack of disc swelling probably are associated with serial positivity. You might be more likely to get uh, a positive aquaporin-4 assay for these patients. However, again, we, we, we will emphasize again that there might be some overlap in what is, what is known as typical versus atypical optic neuritis. And uh, the, both of these patients, according to some studies, can have uh, equal percentage of serial positivity. So how do we treat NMO optic neuritis? Well, first you treat them just like you treat any optic neuritis. You start the patients in IV steroids, but you taper them slowly because you want to wait for the results of the assay, right? And you have to follow them closely while you, uh, while you are maintaining them on oral steroids. If they don't improve with IV steroids, let's say after a week, then you need to do plasma exchange. And you need to do that early again. You need this window, this early window, to, uh, to get any kind of good visual outcome. And for bilateral cases, you should have a very low threshold of treating this patient. Remember, NMO is a blinding disease. The patient can end up with permanent visual disability if you don't treat them early. So, and there are some studies that looked at that and the fact that 
they found that the best clinical outcome was with simultaneous IV methylprednisone and plasma exchange within two to five days from onset. As far as chronic treatment, you can use uh, immunosuppressive, so you can use azathioprine, rituximab, uh, second line agents, and also there are some um, um, new monoclonal antibodies on the pipeline and some of them in the market as well, mainly complement inhibitors and interleukin-6 inhibitors for chronic treatment of neuromyelitis optica. And what about MOG, NTMOG? So MOG tends to be more common in children, and it's an inflammatory demyelinating disease. It can present in children as a syndrome of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And about 30% of children with demyelinating disease will be positive for MOG. And you don't really get, you, you never get both seropositivity for MOG and acoporin at the same time. So how do you suspect MOG? It tends to be recurrent and bilateral. There, sent, there tend to be more disc edema in these patients, unlike typical optic neuritis, and they can get disc hemorrhages. Remember, all these features are atypical and were considered atypical for a typical optic neuritis. They tend to respond quickly to steroids, and once you stop steroids, then they tend to recur. And vision loss, although more severe at onset, they tend to have a better uh, long-term visual prognosis. So uh, neuroimaging for MOG, again, you would see um, the same kind of long segment lesion that we saw for NMO. But the additional thing is that here you can have a perineuritis type of picture, which is enhancement of the optic nerve sheath. Around the, around the optic nerve. This is thought to be a fairly specific sign for uh, NMO optic neuritis. And then the way you treat it, um, the acute treatment is the same. You can treat, use IV steroids, you can, you can use plasma exchange if they don't improve. And again, plasma exchange works better if you give it uh, early. How about chronic treatment? You can use any of those uh, uh, immunosuppressive agent that we, use, that we mentioned for uh, NMO. However, there are some studies that suggested actually monthly IV immunoglobulin might be beneficial for these patients. This is just a table to compare the different types and different phenotypes of optic neuritis. So the main thing is that neuroimaging, long segment of the optic nerve sheath, posterior visual pathway, chiasmal involvement is more suggestive of MOG or acoporin-4 and the distribution of lesions in the, in the brain and MRI also is different. Well, what about pediatric optic neuritis? Pediatric optic neuritis tends to be bilateral, presents with severe disc edema or papillitis, tends to be post-infectious, and pain is often up, absent in these uh, in the kids. They tend to have the kind of same uh, association with MS, um, the risk of MS uh, in certain, certain studies was 36% uh, at two years, and the risk is higher if they have positive oligoclonal band. Sorry. Pediatric optic neuritis and NMO. NMO frequently present with isolated optic neuritis without transverse myelitis as opposed to adults. And aquaporin-4 was associated with early recurrence and visual uh, impairment. Uh, the Pediatric Optic Neuritis Perspective Outcome Study is a study that is under, uh, going right now in North America where they're recruiting uh, patients from 45 uh, sites and they're trying to determine the ability to enroll patients with optic neuritis uh, uh, in this research protocol and trying to estimate the visual acuity six months after the initial presentation of the treatment. So as far as optic neuritis, there are some questions that probably we have not yet addressed is what is the optimal dose for steroids for optic neuritis? Um, some people using three grams, some people use five grams, some people using seven grams. Is our high dose steroids and uh, high dose oral steroids equivalent? Oral steroids are cheaper and easier to administer. Should we use oral steroids instead of IV steroids? What is the effect of delay of initiating steroids on the visual outcome? Does it really make a difference if we treat the patient within a week or uh, a week, uh, two weeks later? And what is the role of PLEX? Should we really give plasma exchange to every optic neuritis that does not really improve with uh, steroids? Uh, 
So to summarize, optic neuritis is not a single disease anymore. And um, the OTT guidelines really apply to only one type of optic neuritis, which is the MS-associated optic neuritis. Well, now we have specific biomarkers that are looking at uh, trying to, uh, that have characterized and defined certain phenotypes of optic neuritis, and this will predict the natural history and prognosis and will guide the treatment. Ophthalmologists should have a low threshold for testing uh, for these biomarkers in cases of optic neuritis presenting with atypical features, and early steroids and plasma exchange is important in preventing permanent visual loss, particularly in NMO optic neuritis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Next, Dr. Dana will talk about neuroophthalmic diagnosis, not to miss. Okay, uh, thanks again. We're going to be talking about neuroophthalmic diagnoses not to miss. I have no financial disclosures. So I hope that at, by the end of this talk, we all recognize urgent neuroophthalmic cases and how to manage them. The one most common cause of death that is common in all these cases is that there is some underlying acute vascular pathology. So let's talk about our first case. This is a 22-year-old young lady who came to me with headaches and pulsatile tinnitus over the past four weeks, and she presented with progressive vision loss over a few days. Her vision was 20-20, she was full color, but she did have a right RAPD. Her visual fields showed severe constriction, and she had severe bilateral optic nerve head swelling. So the fact that she had these symptoms along with the optic nerve head swelling and this vision loss prompted us to say this is probably papilledema. And because of the severe vision loss, we call this fulminant papilledema. So we all know that papilledema is optic nerve head swelling secondary to high intracranial pressure. The patient can present with symptoms of headaches, pulsatile tinnitus, nausea, and vomiting. And they can present with transient visual obscurations and binocular diplopia or progressive vision loss. They will have bilateral optic nerve head swelling. And they may initially present with a normal afferent system. So they may have full color, full 20-20 vision, no RAPD, and just an enlarged blind spot. But if this was chronic, untreated, or fulminant, it can certainly progress to severe visual loss. And if they wait a little longer, they may even snuff out their central visual acuity to no light perception. So why do we worry about papilledema? Well, we just said that it can cause blindness, but it may also harbor an underlying cause of death. And so the three things that we want to remember when we see a case that we think is papilledema is that malignant hypertension may look like this and it can cause a hemorrhagic stroke. We need to rule out cerebral venous thrombosis by a venogram study. And we need to rule out a space occupying lesion with an imaging of some sort. The, le the reason that space occupying lesions that cause papilledema are dangerous is because they can cause herniation of the medulla and cut off the vascular blood supply to the cardiorespiratory centers in the medulla, causing sudden death. So what happened to our patient? We checked her blood pressure, we asked for a CT and a CTV, they were both normal, and because of her severe progressive vision loss, we admitted her and did an MRI MRV with contrast, which showed only features of high intracranial pressure, and an LP was done, and the opening pressure hit the roof with 55 centimeters of wire, very, very high, and normal CSF composition. So what's your diagnosis? idiopathic intracranial hypertension. But because of the severe progressive vision loss over the past few days, we call this fulminant IIH, which constitutes about 2% of all regular IIH. These patients are urgent. You need to admit them, you need to treat them medically, and ultimately a surgical treatment should be done. So the medical treatment includes medication Diamox, two to four grams a day, but we be aware of metabolic acidosis, so follow those patients carefully. Also control the risk factors. So if the patient is anemic with a very low hemoglobin and they need a blood transfusion, for example, you need to control those risk factors. You need to remove any offending agent, such as a medication, for example. And you may or may not give IV steroids, but there's no clear evidence. 
Ultimately, you need a surgical treatment. And if you cannot do the surgery within 24 to 48 hours, you have to at least ask for a temporary lumbar drain. You have the choice of one of three treatments, optic nerve sheath fenestration, if the vision loss is worse than the headache, a CSF diversion procedure, if there's a severe headache and vision loss, or you can also do a transverse sinus stenting, uh, which has emerging evidence. But keep in mind that if you do choose a stent, the patient will be on a dual antiplatelet therapy, so uh, should the stent fail, uh, nobody wants to touch them from a surgical standpoint. We chose optic nerve sheath fenestration for this patient, and she improved her visual fields to driving vision. So ha thankfully, this is a happy ending. So the pearls for papil papilledema is to always check the blood pressure, do a CTCTV to rule out the causes that can cause high morbidity and mortality. And remember that recognizing fulminant IH is important. Admit these patients, and ultimately they will need surgery. The next case. The answer is in the... This is an 85-year-old female who presented to us at night to our junior resident with sudden vision loss of her right eye. She had counting finger visions with a right RAPD and a seemingly normal rest of her neuroophthalmic exam. Now, she, her blood pressure was very high. It was a 209 over 108. And because she had, she's 85 and she had the sudden vision loss, she was asked about GCA symptoms, and she had headaches and some jaw claudication. And she had a serology done, which one could argue may be borderline ESR for her age, but a normal CRP, and there was no relative thrombocytosis. So what's going on here? Normal fundus, but sudden vision loss in RAPD. There must be something going on. It's likely ischemic in nature. So is it an, a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy? Well, it's not anterior because there's no optic nerve head swelling. If it's posterior, then you want to ask yourself, is it arteritic or not arteritic? Any ischemic pathology in the world, that's the first question you want to ask yourself. Is it arteritic or non-arteritic? If it's non-arteritic, these are the cases that usually are post-surgery. There is blood loss. There is hypovolemia. So this patient didn't have any of that. Or is it arteritic? So, of course, you know, to check for serology, do a temporal artery biopsy, and start on steroids. Or did this patient have a retinal arterial ischemia, but we're still not seeing the changes in the fundus, which can happen sometimes early on. So what do we do if that's the case? Well, two things. Is it arteritic or non-arteritic? And if it's non-arteritic, which is the most common cause for retinal arterial ischemia, that's an emergency, because the patient has a higher risk of stroke if you don't optimize the risk factors. So you want to check their blood pressure. You want to check for vasculopathic risk factors. In fact, a study looked at CRAO patients, and they found that about 60% of CRAO patients had at least one vasculopathic risk factor that they didn't know about. And the most common one, how is hypercholesterolemia? You need to do a CT angiogram because the most common cause of a CRAO is carotid disease. And it could be carotid occlusive disease, or it could be carotid just ulcerating disease. You need to start the patient on antiplatelets, and you need, of course, to send them urgently to do a stroke workup. Or is it an arteritic? And we know what to do, serology, biopsy, and uh, steroids. So what happened to our patient? Well, we decided to work them up for non-arteritic and arteritic. And we knew that the answer was going to be in one diagnostic testing. But we were, this was at night, so we didn't have the test. So we brought the patient the next day. We did an OCT of the macula. And as you can see here, there's this hyperreflective band in the inner nuclear, inner plexiform layer. And this is a diagnosis called paracentral acute middle maculopathy. This is a fairly new di uh, diagnosis, uh, this OCT diagnosis. It was described by Saraf and his group in 2013. And what it is, it's is ischemia of the retinal uh, middle retinal plexus. And this could occur in malignant hypertension. It could occur in uh, different types of vasculitis. It even can occur in young patients, and they call idiopathic. In this patient, you could, we could have chalked it up to malignant hypertension, given her blood pressure was 209 over 108. Um, but I will tell you the rest of the story. In retrospect, when you look at the fundus, there's these little white spots there that you can see. And these are very subtle findings um, that of the PAM that we see here in the uh, OCT of the macula. So remember, this patient is 85. She had the headache and the you know, jaw claudication. She had a borderline ESR. So we did a temporal artery biopsy, and this was giant cell arteritis. So vision loss in GCA can be transient and can be permanent. If it's transient, consider amaurosis fugax, of course. It could be ciliary retinal artery occlusion, central retinal artery occlusion, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, could be ocular ischemic syndrome. It could be a visual field deficit from uh, strokes, mostly posterior circulation strokes. But you can add to your list PAM as a cause for vision loss in GCA.
So whenever you have ischemia of any sort, ask yourself, is it arthritic or non-arthritic? If it's arthritic, ischemic, or retinal, then uh, do the serology biopsy and steroids. And if it's non-arthritic retinal ischemia, do the stroke workup because you have a role in reducing the risk of a recurrent TIA or a stroke by 80% should they optimize their risk factors. Next case. This is a patient uh, who came to me in the clinic with a headache to rule out GCA. This was a 68-year-old man. When a patient comes to me in my eye clinic with a headache, I don't know all the causes of headache in the world, but I know what I need to know. So I have an algorithm. Is the headache coming from the eye? Is it coming from the orbit? Or is it a systemic cause of headache? So things from the eye you'll see, obviously, like, you know, scleritis or something like that. People tend to forget shingles before the rash or intermittent angle closure glaucoma. When it's the orbit, again, you'll see orbital features, such as cellulitis, orbital inflammatory syndrome. The one that we forget here is trochleitis, so touch those trochleas. And systemic causes are the causes that may cause death. So this is the malignant hypertension, GCA, high ICP, Horner syndrome, third nerve palsy, uh, neurological visual field deficits, and diplopia, which may indicate a pituitary apoplexy. Of course, a history of malignancy, trauma, and also, because I know about migraines and trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, I will ask about those. So these are the things that if I ask about and examine for, I would then sleep, you know, soundly at night knowing that I did not miss an important diagnosis. So this patient had a very, very subtle anisocoria, and the patient did not even know about it. The anisocoria was worse um, in the dark, and so you would want to consider a Horner syndrome. This patient had a dilation lag on examination, with a Horner, you can have reversal of anisocoria with the aproclonidine, and you can have a persistence of one millimeter or more of anisocoria uh, post-cocaine. So how do you diagnose uh, or localize a Horner? Well, really clinically. So with the associated features that come with a Horner, is it coming from the brainstem? Is it coming from, you know, the chest, smoker, pancos tumor, or is it coming from the, you know, a cavernous sinus? Uh, in this case, you want to make sure that if, the, if it was a painful horner, then, or an acute horner, you want to rule out a carotid dissection with doing a CT of the uh, CT angio of the head and neck. And if there's a high suspicion, also do an MRI because sometimes it's missed on a CT angio. This patient had a left carotid dissection. He was treated. The headache improved, but the horner persisted. Okay, so a painful horner is a carotid dissection. Do your vascular imaging. This is a case... <laughs> I don't know if I can play this. Okay. This is a case that was sent from the emergency department to our resident. Um, she was sent for cellulitis, but uh, there's nothing really cellulite about her. Like, she has left complete ptosis. She has a non-pharmacological dilated pupil. She has complete duction deficit, a superduction deficit, and infraduction deficit, which indicates that this was a left complete pupil spar uh, sparing isolated third nerve palsy with no uh, aberrant regeneration. Did you guys see? Pupil dilated? Yeah. Non-pharmacologically dilated pupil. Pupil involving third nerve. Did I say pupil sparing? Oh, sorry. I meant pupil involving. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. So, um, that's a trick, so you're like, awake with me. <laughs> All right, the three things to, to learn about the third. Rule out a PCOM aneurysm with a CT angiogram, okay, of the head and neck. Rule out GCA in the right context. And once you roll the, rule those things out, then you consider about other pathologies. The third thing that I'd like to add here uh, would be something that causes a pupil sparing and uh, a painless third nerve. Only after you've ruled out the first two is myasthenia gravis, because it can look like a, a third nerve. Now, uh, whether it's pupil sparing or pupil involving, by the way, the, the inclination is to image all comers of third nerve palsies because up to 13% of pupil um, sparing third nerve palsies turn out to have uh, a PCOM aneurysm or some compressive etiology. So what happened to our patient? She had a left PCOM aneurysm. She was admitted that night. Neurosurgery did their job and they clipped it and uh, this patient is forever grateful for our resident for saving her life. Okay, our last case. A 44-year-old man comes into our emergency eye clinic and they present to our resident with saying that, oh, my vision in the right eye is not really good. The resident takes a look, does a full neuroophthalmic exam, and the only thing that the resident could catch is that the patient had 20-30 vision in their eye, uh, in the right eye, but nothing really else. The, pa the resident told the, the patient, 
well, come next week, we will do diagnostic testing, we'll have visual fields, we'll have OCTs, let's see what's going on. So they come back the next week, that's when I saw them, and that the patient now is 2060 in the right eye, he has a right RAPD, and a concomitant small uh, exotropia. This patient on visual field testing had a right junctional scotoma. So now you know, with this headache, and this, you know, rapid onset or rapid progression of vision loss, that there's something scary going on there. So when you have something that is progressively getting worse and fast, that localizes to the cella, the one thing that you want to rule out is some acute vascular pathology. So what is an acute vascular pathology within the cellar region? Well, is it an aneurysm of the ICA or is it a pituitary apoplex? This patient had a very rapidly growing pituitary uh, adenoma, okay? And although it didn't look like hemorrhagic on the imaging, it was going to progress into a pituitary apoplexy if it waited a few days, which can kill the patient. This patient was admitted that night and resected. My neurosurgery and the visual field thankfully improved. So pituitary apoplexy is either infarction or hemorrhage into a pituitary macroadenoma. It's a triad of vision loss, headaches, and severe uh, and uh, ophthalmoplegia. Um, they require urgent neuroimaging, and remember that steroids can be life-saving in these patients. So in conclusion, remember the cases not to miss in neuroophthalmology. Papilledema, is it malignant hypertension, a lesion, or fulminant IAH, or cerebral venous thrombosis? Painful horner is a carotid dissection. Arterial occlusion, is it arthritic or non-arthritic? A third nerve palsy, is it a PCOM or GCA? And pituitary apoplexy, don't forget your triad, headaches, ophthalmoplegia, and vision loss. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Next week, Dr. Rai will be talking about OCT in neuro ophthalmology. Okay. So, those of you who have been here early today, they probably listened to lectures about OCT and glaucoma, never, they never think, never think about OCT in neuro-ophthalmology. <laughs> Actually, we do, there, there's a huge role for OCT in neuro-ophthalmology right now. And if you think what happens to the optic nerve, it either can swell, it can atrophy, right? And this is what we use the OCT for, is to monitor changes in the optic nerve. And because we're neuro-ophthalmologists and we're not necessarily getting neuro-ophthalmic diseases, we might get other diseases such as retinal diseases and maculopathies. We use the OCT to differentiate these diseases from neuro-ophthalmic disorders. So um, these are the two, probably one of the two most common machines and the, um, the retinal fiber analysis that you would see, the spectralis machine and on the left side and the serous machine, uh, sorry, spectralis and the serous machine. But more importantly now, there's a, a growing role for measuring the ganglion cell layer, uh, specifically looking for uh, optic neuropathies. And again, this is the spectralis, OCT at the top, and the serous at the bottom. So if you think of optic neuritis, what happens with the neurofiber fiber layer initially, they, of course it swells, and this can be not really informative at the beginning because um, it doesn't really give us any information. But what happens is that within three, maybe up to six months, the thinning tend to plateaus, and we don't really see thinning beyond that. This is from a study by uh, Fiona Costello. So this is the point where probably that the, you don't see further loss of the nerve fiber layer. And this is an, an RFL uh, analysis from patients with optic neuritis, and there is a peculiar, there is a, there is a um, tendency for the temporal quadrant to be involved uh, uh, with optic neuritis, and you would see thinning of the temporal quadrants and the maculopapular bundle. And you can notice here that, that although the, there is thinning of the OCT, the visual field looks absolutely normal. So there's temporal thinning actually in both sides, and this is the macrofiber bundle. So the advantage of having the ganglion cell layer analysis is that it's really not affected by the initial swelling that you would see with um, 
uh, of the nerve fiber layer, right? So you can actually monitor ganglion cell loss very early on in the course of optic neuritis. And um, this can start within a week or two following optic neuritis. It's during that time, you will have just nerve fiber layer swelling if you just use the nerve fiber layer analysis. And this is a, um, a ganglion cell layer analysis showing loss of ganglion cell layer on the, uh, on the left side already developing in this patient with optic neuritis. Again, this is another example of uh, RNFL loss in optic neuritis, and you can notice that there's a propensity for the temporal quadrants to be involved. And this is a patient with optic neuritis, and you can see that there is loss of the ganglion cell layer. So the red indicates kind of healthy, if you like. So loss of red around the, uh, in the macular indicates thinning of the ganglion cell layer. And this is a, 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 just to show you the progression of the ganglion cell layer change in a patient with optic neuritis. So right from the onset, right from the get-go, where the nerve fiber layer looks normal, you're already seeing ganglion cell layer uh, right on the onset. And this tends to be stable even after three to six months. With that, you can get probably more progressive thinning of the uh, nerve fiber layer. So the ganglion cell ten will proceed uh, RNFL layer changes by at least a few months. And we now use MS, sorry, we now use OCT for multiple sclerosis because patients with multiple sclerosis, even if they don't have history of optic neuritis, they will have thinning of the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer, and they will have more rapid progression of this thinning than normal people. So you can actually use the OCT to screen for this patient as, as an adjunctive tool to help the neurologist uh, for the diagnosis of uh, multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> Recently, we've started using OCT to differentiate different types of optic neuritis, so we can try to differentiate NMO optic neuritis from typical MS optic neuritis. And generally speaking, retinal nerve fiber layer loss tends to be more severe, more uh, more significantly worse in NMO than optic neuritis. There are some studies that, show, that showed that if you lose about 41 microns of thickness, this is almost 100% specific for NMO. Remember, with a typical optic neuritis, you lose about 10, maybe 15 microns. The NFL loss tends to be more diffuse in uh, NMO, while in MS, uh, optic neuritis tends to be more temporal, and I can show you some uh, uh, this this uh, picture will show you that on the left side you have NMO. You can notice that there is more diffuse loss. It's not just uh, the temporal quadrant. It tends to be all over the optic nerve head. And there's even more loss of the ganglion cell layer in NMO than in MS optic neuritis. Um, the other use for OCT is that uh, patients with MS can, are, can be on uh, different treatments. One of them is fingolimod, and fingolimod has been associated with macular edema. So we can use OCT to screen for patients who have fingolimod-associated macular edema. It looks exactly like what you see with diabetic macular edema, and you can see these cystic changes of the uh, inner nuclear layer. Once you stop the treatment, the edema goes away, and uh, um, generally speaking, there's a recommendation to have a baseline and follow up OCT for these patients. What about in papilledema? So there is a role for OCT in papilledema right now. And you can actually use the, the nerve fiber layer therapy, not as much as to diagnose papilledema, because we know that the quantitative measurements, just measuring the nerve fiber layer, does not really differentiate papilledema from pseudopapilledema. But it's more helpful to monitor changes in the nerve fiber, fiber layer in someone who has established papilledema. And this, um, so this can help you actually in, in sort of trying to determine whether this patient is improving, and you can actually, it can actually guide your treatment. Remember, improvement in the nerve fiber layer thickness doesn't really necessarily uh, implies improvement. It can also implies optic atrophy and loss of the nerve fiber layer. So this is someone with a patient with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and you can see there's 
disc edema, as, and there's a thickening of the nerve fiber layer. And you can even see on the transverse scan, OCT scan, that there is uh, sort of this dome-shaped, like bilateral humped dome-shaped elevation of the optic nerve. And this is someone who actually had unilateral asymmetric papilledema, which is quite, which is relatively rare. And you can see that from baseline that there's a nerve fiber layer thickening, and with treatment, once you put this patient on treatment, you give them diamox, the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness goes back to normal. This is someone with, um, with the IIH as well, and you can see at the top that there is thickening of the nerve fiber layer on the uh, on the left side, and with treatment, um, the nerve fiber layer thickness sort of decreases. But you kind of notice here, if you look at the left, on the upper left side, that there is uh, there was an enlarged blind spot at the beginning on the left side. The enlargement of the blind spot disappears, goes back to normal, but you still have a residual kind of nasal visual field defect. So. This is just to reemphasize the point that improvement in RNFL thickness doesn't usually implies improvement in vision. It could just implies optic atrophy. Now we have to be careful with patients with severe papilledema because often at this stage the segmentation algorithm fail and you can get segmentation errors. So the segmentation is the line that is supposed to be aligned with different specific layers of the retina. And at this point you can re cannot really rely on the uh, on this algorithm to measure the, the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. So people have started looking into more of a qualitative measures of, in the OCT, not more, more quantitative. And um, using transverse OCT, you can look at the way the, uh, the optic nerve head is deformed with increased intracranial pressure. And if you look here, this, this is the terminal RAP and Brooks membrane. What happens with papilledema with increased intracranial pressure, it tends to be angle, it will be uh, angled inwards. So we'll have sort of negative angulation of, these, of this layer. And you can see that in the OCT of this patient at the top, this patient to begin with had papilledema, so you can see the kind of upward uh, negative angulation of the uh, RPE and Brooks membrane. And with normalization of the intracranial pressure, it will go back into the normal kind of V-shaped like configuration in normal individuals. So this is one example of using the quantitative, uh, qualitative measure of uh, parameter of the OCT to diagnose and monitor papilledema. In patients who have chronic papilledema, they have optic atrophy, so the nerve cannot really swell anymore. So you're gonna have to rely on the ganglion cell layer to, to monitor progression of uh, their disease. This is someone who had chronic papilledema, but it, uh, as you can see here, um, he does have a robust ganglion cell layer and there's no thinning of the ganglion cell, or at least not yet. Uh, this is someone with papilledema and you can see uh, the, uh, the, the nerve fiber layer thickness uh, at the top, there's thickening of the nerve fiber layer on the, uh, on the right side, and there is ganglion cell layer loss in the, in the deviation map at the bottom. What about optic nerve head drusen? So this is one of those things that, especially residents, get confused. Is this papilledema? Is this not papilledema? How do we differentiate? papilledema from pseudopapilledema, how do we diagnose optic nerve hydrusin? So uh, optic nerve hydrusin is very common cause for anomalous disc, it tends to occur in about 2% of the population, and the drusen can be superficial and then, or can be buried and not really seen. So the optic disc drusen uh, studies consortium have established certain criteria to diagnose uh, a drusen by uh, using enhanced depth imaging. So, a drusen will have a hyperreflective core with a hyperreflective margin. And you need to differentiate those, for example, from blood vessels, as you can see here with the, the kind of figure of eight uh, uh, configuration. So this is one area where you have to, you, you should not really be uh, confusing the two of them, right? So this is an optic drusen. You can see a hyperreflective core and a hyperreflective margin. 
foams is um, basically hyper-reflective ovoid-like masses that occurs in the peripapillary region. And they are uh, thought to be some kind of a precursor or variant of optic dysdrusion. They're really not specific for optic dysdrusion, and they can be found in different types of optic neuropathies. This is just a case, a uh, 22-year-old with right sudden loss of vision treated with IV steroids as optic neuritis, not improvement. Five months later, had uh, loss of vision on the left side. Um, maternal cousin with labor, so family history of labor already. Visual acuity, 2400 uh, 400 and 2200. This is the um, visual field, and you can see here that the fundus photo, there is already some temple, so there's some uh, atrophy starting to develop on the uh, left side. Maybe some hint of telangiectasia, swelling on the right side. Patient has a left visual field deficit. And this is the uh, ganglion cell analysis showing you a loss of the ganglion cell layer of this patient on both sides. You can see the similar pattern in any kind of toxic optic neuropathy uh, and labor optic neuropathy that, um, that the uh, thinning tends to be on the macular papular bundle and at the bottom here you can see that there is loss of the ganglion cell layer as well. What about compressive optic neuropathy? And Dr. Uh, Albrecht already alluded to that in her talk. You can actually uh, use the OCT to predict the visual outcome of patients who are going or undergoing surgery to remove pituitary tumors or various compressive lesions. So the healthier the RNFL or the GCL, the better is the visual, uh, uh, expected visual outcome. And the other thing is that the OCT here can be localizing just like the visual field. So the pattern of RNFL and GCL loss can really help you in localizing this lesion, the, uh, the lesion. So binasal thinning, for example, you expect that with chiasma lesions. And homonymous, you would see that with uh, retrochiasmal lesions. So this is a patient with a pituitary tumor. And you can see here that uh, there's sort of, it's not really binasal. It doesn't really respect the vertical uh, midline, but you kind of get that flavor as well. And you get the temporal, bitemporal hemi, uh, bitemporal hemianopsia. Uh, this is another patient with a pituitary uh, tumor, pre-op, at the top, bitemporal visual field defect, and a binasal, uh, binasal uh, uh, loss of the ganglion cell layer. Post-operatively, although the visual field improved, the ganglion cell layer uh, analysis did not really improve much. So this is just shows you the dissociation between structure and function, if you like, between visual field and OCT. This is another patient with a meningioma. Now, despite having a normal visual field, she has already lost, she has thinning of the nerve fiber layer, and she has loss of the uh, ganglion cell layer on the left side. What about retrochiasmal lesions? This is a patient with a stroke on the left, and uh, with the right homonymous hemianopsia, and you can see here there is a, a, a homonymous type of ganglion cell uh, loss. So again, we just, the OCT can also uh, be of localizing value, just like the visual field for, um, for uh, localizing where the lesion is. What about non-optic nerve diseases? So uh, because we get referred we, get, we, we always get referrals for different kind of diseases and we, some of these disorders may not be necessarily neurophthalmic. The most common non-optic nerve diseases that we see are either subtle maculopathies, so these can be inherited retinal degeneration or maculopathies, epiretinal membrane, inflammatory disorders of the retina such as mutes or acute macular neuroretinopathy. And in these patients, it's always helpful to look at the outer retina, specifically that ellipsoid zone, the inner segment, outer segment's uh, junction, and look for any kind of irregularities or loss, just to indicate that this is an outer retinal disease, not a, really an optic nerve disease. This is a, a case that I saw recently, a 43-year-old, presented with two-week history of sudden onset of visual loss in the right eye, and seven months ago she was diagnosed, as, she was diagnosed with MS, actually, and was started on treatment. 
So the neurologist thought she had optic neuritis and he wanted to treat her with steroids. She was recently received the uh, AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. Her vision was 2040 and 2030, full color vision, no, no afferent. She did have monomorphopsia on the, using the Amselgrid uh, test on the right side. And if you look at the uh, fundus here, you can see these kind of, kind of like halo, hypopigmented type of lesions around the fovea. So something was going on there in the macula or the fovea. And if you did it in OCT and she had this kind of focal-like elevation of the RPE and the outer retinal layers, and this was in both sides, so it's the top, uh, the right, and the bottom was the left. So she probably had some kind of acute retinal pigment epitheliitis or some kind of inflammatory diseases of the, uh, of the retina. And uh, we did, do, did uh, CT, OCT scans three to six months. There has been no change in the, in the lesion. So OCT here was helpful in kind of not to subject her to IV steroids and the whole, you know, the whole um, uh, consequences of events that will probably lead to misdiagnosis. So in summary, OCT is a non-invasive, highly reproducible tool to assess uh, disc swelling or atrophy in optic neuropathies. It can help diagnose even patients who have MS and asymptomatic earlier in their uh, disease, of course. And the ganglion cell layer is a very useful uh, adjunctive test to monitor the progression of optic neuropathies. It can also, OCT can help you also diagnose papilledema, dyscruzin, and follow up patients with IIH. And um, it's also helpful to differentiate optic neuropathies from non-optic nerve diseases which can present with visual loss. Thank you. Thank you, and with that we're done with this is the last lecture of this session. If anyone has any energy to ask any questions, uh, you all have uh, feel free to ask our speakers. You have a question there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a quick question regarding the last talk. How often do you see OCT findings in patients who have post-chiasmal lesions? How, sorry, what was the question? How often do you see changes in the retinal ganglion oh, so, cell layer on so, OCT so you in post-chiasmal lesions? So you're, say, you're saying transsynaptic degeneration That's correct, findings. Yes. Um, We've, we've seen that in a few cases, patients are presenting with strokes and have had uh, sort of homonymous so, visual so, field defects. So are you expecting to see that in a patient with a posterior stroke? Um, I don't expect to see that in adults because uh, transsynaptic degeneration classically thought to occur only in children. But we do see some of these cases, and I don't know why some patients develop it and some do not develop it. Because you were describing it in an adult uh, just now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't I mean, expect I mean, it we to do usually see it. happen. I just, I just don't, I, I just don't know who is the patient who's going to develop it and who not. But we do see it, and it has been described and reported. Yes. Yeah, I would also like to add to that. I mean, I have seen it, uh, but it happens uh, years later. You can see it actually. There have been case reports, and I've actually had a uh, case in which I've done OCT and it did show ganglion cell loss, like he had like a stroke, like, and this was three years before. So it can happen if you look for it. I don't think we know the answer as to who's going to get it, but I'm sure it uh, has to do with some extent of the lesion as well and how long it's been there. Um, but we do definitely know now that there is some transnap. Well, we happen. see it in children all the time. But, yeah, uh, but we do see it in adults for sure. Thank you. Yeah. other um, um, signs, no signs, only ganglion cell layer. Do we need to do any further investigations, neurological I mean? So this is a question for you. Okay. 
You can answer. Okay, well, because I, mean, I find it so often. So you mean binocular diplopia? And, and, and no, no, not diplopia. It's in the OCT ganglion cell um, layer deficit or thinning. Uh, the patient has n n no other signs, only this, with drop of vision. Um, I don't know. I mean, you probably have to consider the age of the patient uh, as um, well. Older age group. I mean, the first thing that I would think of is probably glaucoma, right? No, In this not glaucoma. Yeah. Definitely. Um, you probably have to look at the OCT. You have to make sure the OCT, the quality of the OCT, the... Is, is of adequate, sufficient quality. It is. Whether it's, if it's asymptomatic, if the patient is asymptomatic, whether you should go ahead and probably investigate. I would cer certainly probably ask questions, more questions to the patient and particularly inquire about the possibility of glaucoma in, the, in these patients. Um, I would probably do visual field as well, test color vision. So you do the, the most comprehensive, the most thorough examination you can do. And if the patient is, uh, if, if all of that doesn't really yield much, I'm not sure what's the answer. The scenario is, for example, a patient coming, a regular patient coming to my uh, clinic, um, and when I examine the vision, I see it's 20, uh, 30, 20, 40, uh, sorry, viscorrected, uh, w with no uh, corneal affection, no lens opacity, uh, no retinal affection, nothing, nothing. Uh, pupil is good, uh, color yeah. vision is good. So I do uh, OCD, uh, I, I find this, but I, I, do I need to do further to go for a visual field to do everything? Uh, I, I think I would ask them in the history if they experienced sudden loss of vision, probably previously, and they haven't really, uh, they haven't really pursued, they haven't seen a doctor. The most common thing probably is you think of as, as an old ischemic optic neuropathy or kind of an old ischemic event. And you, it's helpful when you do the OCT also just to, just as Dr. Dana showed, to look at the inner retinal layers as well. Um, many of these patients would have events and they could be asymptomatic. So in our clinic, the most common is ischemic, old ischemic optic neuropathy. It's only after they started they had vision loss in the left eye that they become symptomatic and they come in for, but again, um, if I see optic atrophy, I probably would scan the patient as well just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, so it all depends on the history and the presentation. Are you talking about a unilateral process? <coughs> it's a bilateral process? Yeah, well, I mean, I think a visual field is very important. Like if you have 20, 30 vision that you cannot refract to better, and you have thinning of the GCIPL, you don't have complete story unless you have a field. So you have to have a visual field done. They may have a central scotoma, whatever. I mean, it will tell you more, give you more information. You're stuck with this case now. Yeah. yeah. But when you did the GCIPL, you did it for a reason, because you couldn't get the vision, right? So there must be something else that can give you more information. Right? So I think a visual field is definitely something that could be helpful for you. Yeah, I, I have one more question. This one is for uh, Dr. Dana. The, it was an interesting case you showed with the 85-year-old uh, woman with paracentral uh, middle maculopathy who uh, you ended up diagnosing with uh, giant cell arteritis. We see the paracentral middle maculopathy in young patients, often with migraines, females. If you have a patient presenting with that, visual loss with that, and, and you find that on the OCT, are you suggesting that we need to do a vascular workup for those patients? I, I am. But I will tell you that uh, it has been described in young women, especially that is idiopathic. But, you know, you may anticipate that your workup will be negative. But in the end, it is a vascular etiology. So you have to treat it as a vascular problem. But those vessels are so small. I mean, that's not the vessels that are effective in GCA. Uh, that is very true. But the idea is that there is some watershed zone there. There may have been some, uh, you know, uh, lack of blood flow rather than an actual, like, occlusive process there. You know what I mean? And it has been described in, in GCA more often than we think, actually. Um, so there was a 
paper that uh, looked at PAM and GCA, and they found about 16% of those cases, and I think they had, I can't remember the number, about 50 or 60 cases of GCA uh, with um, vascular pathology, and they found that uh, they have found it more often than expected. And to be honest with you, I've been observing it more and I see a lot of GCA patients and I'm seeing it more and more now that I'm doing OCT maculas on all these patients. I can understand a GCA patient yeah. having it, but a young patient coming in and uh, with a presenting sign of that. I wouldn't look for GCA in a young patient, but it has been described in other vasculitic processes. Of course, in isolation, it would be unusual. Like That's usually the I'm patient saying. will have symptoms or some other systemic issues. So review of systems is good. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's nothing else except this, I would say that it's pre probably extremely rare to have this. Although there was a recent paper actually that described PAM as the initial in <coughs> presentation of uh, granulomatosis um, of polyangiitis, so, you know, beginner's uh, disease. So again, you know, it's been described. So I think thorough history, um, uh, and it, whenever you don't know, like, it, you have to be careful to call something idiopathic before you do some kind of workup, you know, um, unless you're comfortable with this completely, right? So there must be a reason for I it. I understand 100% when you have it uh, in the context of other things, but in isolation in a young patient, I, I agree. I find it difficult. I agree with you. I have a question actually. Uh, this is a question I get asked often by the residents. When do you do ESR and CIRP or would you do for asymptomatic uh, NIN mm -hmm. patient? Uh, that's a great question and uh, that really all goes uh, back to uh, the definition of occult GCA, right? So the GCA, <coughs> occult GCA has either a clinically occult GCA definition or a serologically occult. Clinically occult GCA is defined as a visual symptom, uh, whether transient or, uh, or permanent or sign, but with no symptoms whatsoever of GCA, and the patient has a positive biopsy. Usually they, these patients have high serology, albeit it is lower than their symptomatic counterparts. So that's clinically occult. Serologically occult is the patient who has symptoms, uh, whether visual or sy symptom, usually systemic symptoms, may or may not have visual with those, they will have normal serology and a biopsy that is positive. So there must be something that is going to direct you to look for the GCA. So I'll give you an example. I have a patient who was sent to me for NAION. So I always ask myself in any neuroophthalmic case, what is atypical about this case that's going to make me think that this is not what I think it is? So the patient was sent to me for NAION. He was 90 years old. He had light perception vision, and he had pallid edema. Three things that are completely atypical, although this patient had no symptoms of GCA and was serologically normal, serologically normal. So he has doubly occult, you know? So we started him on IV steroids and did a biopsy, and that was positive for GCA. Another case is the case that I presented, which is a case of bilateral. Honestly, I thought it was a bilateral uh, sequential NAION, but it healed with cupping. So it was very strange that it did. And so I thought, let's just do a biopsy. And indeed, it was another occult GCA. So there must be something that is atypical about the case, you know, um, that will push you to, to, to look for GCA. Um, no, it's just we don't really see as much GCA right. here as you probably do in, in Canada. But yeah, like I said, one thing that I noticed is this a tendency to get this cupping, which you don't see with uh, with the non-ischemic. The other thing is that there's a, the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is more common, I think, in giant cell arteritis than it's probably thought to be. So whenever you see someone like the patient you presented with loss of vision and the disc looks normal, you got to get an OCT as well, but you need to think of giant cell arteritis as well with differential. I have a question for uh, Donna. Do you get um, these biomarkers for uh, uh, for NMO and MOG for every optic neuritis? So what is your approach? Someone comes with optic neuritis and you get an MRI, so how do you proceed from there? Mm -hmm. um, I personally do, and I think this is a question um, that is answered depending on who you ask, but I will get the MOG and NMO uh, because I always, most, now I'm going to say always, I'm going to say most of the time, I look for something that is atypical. 
uh, because it's very, very difficult to be super confident that this is such a typical optic neuritis. Um, for me, even a family history of lupus makes this atypical, for example. You know what I mean? So I would get to the NMO and MOG, and also I will try to get the MRI orbits quickly because I also, even if the patient, let's say, presents typically from a clinical standpoint, if I see on the MRI orbits that it's a longer, you know, enhancement or extending beyond 50% or the, there's a perineuritis or it's a posterior involvement, this all turns it into an atypical optic neuritis. So I do, I do do NMO and MOG uh, on, I would say, most of my cases, unless the patient came to me already resolved and the nerve looks like that of, um, you know, idiopathic or MS then that I would say, you know what, if it behaves differently, then I would go for that, but it looks like it's self-resolving, it went back to normal, um, and that if the MRI was normal otherwise, or there was, of course, demyelinating plaque looking at MS, like MS, then I would, yeah, but otherwise I would. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, just to emphasize, this is an overlap, this clinical overlap, and mm -hmm. even the term typical, atypical, mm -hmm. I think there, there is, there's a recent editorial, the Journal of Neurology, that is discouraging this use, it's mm -hmm. typical versus atypical. And you should uh, treat, you should deal with it as an optic neuritis. So you should have a really thresh, low threshold for obtaining uh, the biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is about, I had mentioned NMO. And if I suspect NMO from the get go, um, for um, as the history of like, uh, you know, transverse myelitis, persistent hiccups, persistent nausea, vomiting, I would actually uh, start them on the IV steroids and also on the. At the same yeah. time. If I'm having a high yeah. suspicion. Because, as you mentioned, it is a better. Okay. I think we're done for today. I would like to thank our speakers. And I would like to thank everyone who has stayed back uh, at this time. And we are done with today's session. And hopefully, inshallah, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.